Welcome to Beyond Sports with Paul and Jeremy. Uh, this week we have a special guest coming in. Uh, I'll let Jeremy introduce uh, John, and then we'll uh, get into some of the topics that we're going to be talking about today. All right, John, great friend of mine, known him for years. Um, he has a, a quite an eccentric taste in hobbies and sports, and um, we wanted to talk a little bit about soccer, and he's one of the people that I know that really loves the sport and um, is really engaged in it. And so we wanted him to talk about MLS particularly, but also just kind of the state of soccer and just his love of soccer. So we'll ask him a little bit about, you know, his, his personal experience with the game of soccer and um, particularly MLS. And we can go from there and try to have a good conversation. Happy to be here. So to start out, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and then your background with soccer and then um, what types of things drew you towards soccer and how it's evolved or how it's uh, affected your life um, to this point, I guess. Sure. I, I grew up playing soccer. Soccer was my, uh, my sport that I attached to most uh, as a child. I played a little basketball, played a little football, uh, but the, the sport that I really ended up sticking with was soccer. And I, I think I played soccer from the time I was in about third grade all the way through high school. Um, I, I love the, the game. Uh, it was cheap, which my, my parents were, were uh, very cost conscious when it came to, to picking sports for me and my brothers. Um, and it was something that we could always play. Uh, we could always have pickup games uh, with my friends. And it was also a very popular sport uh, where I grew up. So I grew up in Virginia Beach. Uh, Virginia Beach, uh, most people don't know, had the first soccer specific stadium in the country. And it was actually at a soccer complex that I grew up playing rec soccer at. Uh, so I, I went to a bunch of minor league soccer games before there was such thing as major league soccer. Uh, I still remember going to an exhibition game uh, between the Chicago Fire and the New York, New Jersey Metro Stars, the, the first season of major league soccer. And they were doing a little tour and came through Virginia Beach. Uh, but uh, I, I always loved the sport. Um, I've been a big sports fan in general, uh, which Jeremy can vouch for. I, I, we were roommates in college, and I, I basically never got off the TV on Saturdays. Just love watching, whether it was college football, college basketball, NFL, uh, all sorts of sports. I'm addicted to it. I even played uh, team handball in college for, for our uh, team handball team and, and stuck with that after college. But uh, my love affair with soccer sort of continued uh, about six years ago when Major League Soccer announced a new franchise in New York. And at that point, uh, I wasn't really a Major League Soccer fan. I, I didn't follow uh, the domestic league that much. I was following uh, a, a couple leagues in Europe. I watched some Italian soccer, watched some Premier League in the, the UK. Uh, but when New York City FC founded in New York, uh, I've been living in New York for about five years at a time, and I didn't have any New York-based teams. All my teams are from where I grew up. Uh, so I, it felt like a great opportunity to get in on the ground floor. Uh, I became a founding supporter uh, of New York City FC. I've had season tickets with a friend of mine ever since and uh, go to all the matches, travel around to a bunch of different matches uh, in different cities, been to Chicago, been to Orlando a few times, uh, been to, to L.A., been to Seattle a couple of times. I just love going and, and supporting my my club, and it's got me into the domestic game more in general, and especially as a league that's been doing so much growth uh, and yeah. really explosive growth over the last five years. Where it's come even since the time I started watching it is just unreal. Uh, it's a really exciting time to be a fan of Major League Soccer. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I noticed the most, learning a little bit more about MLS. Like, I have had FIFA played that, like if I had cousins that played soccer all throughout uh, childhood and high school, friends that played uh, in college as well, but I never was one. So when you're talking about all the sports you played when you were a kid, I was like football, baseball, and then in high school, I did a little bit of baseball, uh, sorry, track, um, what else? track, chess, swimming and diving. So did a little bit of everything. Uh, football was definitely my sport as well. But I do think that the growth in uh, MLS from the time that it started to now is is pretty amazing. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things that we definitely want to 
kind of like talk about, right? So MLS, I think it was was 96 the first year. Was that 96, 98, something like that? Uh, it, it was around that time. It was mid-90s. Yeah. Uh, um, the MLS came around for the, the first time. It started as a really small league, and it was – sort of the, the reincarnation of a bunch of failed leagues. Uh, so you had, like, the North American Soccer League that was big in the, the 80s uh, where Pele came over and there was sort of a soccer boom. But the, the United States had really been without a major professional soccer league for a while when MLS came around. Yeah, I think, um, what was it? For, for me, um, with soccer, I've only had uh, limited exposure with professional teams. So I know it's not MLS level, but Indy has like the, it's the Indy Fire or something like that, maybe. Yeah, um, Indy 11, right? Indy 11, yeah, Indy 11. Yeah. I went to like one of their games and it was actually very well attended. And that was something that was surprising because, okay, soccer, yeah, whatever, I guess, uh, especially for Indy. But Indy actually has a really huge soccer following with a lot of, um, like club teams, a lot of high schools have these soccer teams that are actually good. Um, one of my cousin's friends, his brother, I think, went to UCLA to play uh, soccer in this was like in the the late '90s, I think it was. So when UCLA was like really, um, really strong. So I think I think soccer is very, very interesting, and with the aspect of growth, right? I think they started out with ten teams, went down to eight, and it's like. 28 or something right now uh that's that's a huge amount to grow yeah, with there's, of 20 years got 26 teams and growing and i think the league has already set a target to get up to 30 and you got a lot of uh cities that already have bids out there so you've got cities that are already guaranteed come in uh like charlotte charlotte's got a, a guaranteed team they don't have a name for the team uh, they don't have a, a structure yet they don't have real concrete plans, but they've already won the bid. They're guaranteed to come in. And so I, I think they'll hit that 30 mark probably within the next five years if they have that as a target. Uh, they're getting some big expansion fees to, to do that. Yes. And, uh, 100, 200 yeah, it, million, right? Yeah, it keeps growing every single time. It keeps growing. And the, I mean, the, the value of the teams goes up with everyone. And the owners want to get paid to, to cut down on their portion of that, that value because you water down the league with everyone. But, uh, I mean, we've got a big country. And when you look at a lot of the, the leagues in Europe, you have 20 team leagues as a standard. But 20 teams in a, a country the size of the, the UK is, uh, is pretty dense. Uh, I think 30 teams can be supported. I, I think we're all right. There's only so many people that like soccer right now. How do you see – the MLS growing in terms of its fan base and the ability to sustain 30 teams as they want to in the future? I, th I think there are a couple of key points that, that Major League Soccer can focus on uh, to, to help expand it. One, I think something, Paul, you were alluding to when you went to that uh, Indy 11 game, you saw more people there than you thought. But, um, I mean, that's something you get from a lot of different leagues. If you look at the, the NHL attendance versus NBA attendance. NBA is so much more profitable and just a, a more popular sport by just leaps and bounds, not even close. But NHL games are very, very well attended. I mean, there are most cities that NHL has teams that are in the same city as NBA teams. The attendance for those NHL games are actually better than the, the NBA uh, games. The the big thing is there's way more people watching on TV with, with NBA, right? And I think you got to strike that balance. I mean, where are you going to find those fans? Are the fans going to be in the stadium or are they going to be watching on TV? you got to have different uh, plans with the, the structure on that. But building up a great game day atmosphere is something that MLS has been able to do. And the new teams that have come in have actually been especially good at it. Uh, Atlanta United is the big poster child for this. Atlanta United um, it was averaging uh, about 50,000 people uh, a match in, in the stadium That's wild. Uh, for a portion of their season and actually got up to 70,000 uh, for, for a match. That was on the, the weekend that they got 70,000 
for a regular season game, they actually had more attendance than almost anyone in Europe. They were on on par with a Barcelona game to just give you a, a comparison. So, and they're a new team. They're a new market. They're they're a market that a lot of people had a lot of doubts at. What is Atlanta really gonna work uh, for for soccer? It's already got other teams, other sports. Is this the type of people who like go into it? But I think that there are some surprising things you can learn about. And I I think one area that is really really untapped that a lot of people don't talk about is especially the, the Latin American audience and the, the Mexican audience in particular. Major League Soccer is the, the soccer league of the U.S. and, and Canada because uh, you got some Canadian teams in there too. It is not the most watched league in the, the U.S. The most watched league on TV in the U.S. is Liga MX, the Mexican soccer league. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a huge, huge fan base of, of soccer fans in the, the U.S., uh, that just happen not to speak English, and they are absolutely soccer crazy. And if MLS can find any way to get those fans into seats and get them as dedicated to the U.S. teams as they are to the, the Mexican teams, they've got an inbuilt audience. I think that that's uh, pretty crazy if they're able to do that. So at IU uh, for grad school, a lot of times the, the men's team, and I think maybe the women's team, but the men's team – plays the under-21 or under-17 Mexican national team. And that game is so interesting because you'll, you'll get to the stands, you have IU or on one side of the stands, you'll have Mexican uh, fans on the other, other side. And one side, the IU side is just chill, calm, relaxed. And then the other side is just rowdy, just going at it. And it's such a cool environment to see. And I feel that if every soccer game was like that up here, Oh, I think that fans would, would definitely start watching the games as well. And I think that when you talked about that concept of being there as a physical um, spectator, right, at a soccer game, it's, at least for now, it seems like it's something that works fairly well, right? They're bringing out 20,000 people on average to each game. That's, that's a huge number, right? More than the NBA, which is, which is kind of astounding, right? But that, that market, right? They don't have that that TV market that the NBA has yet. But I do feel that they can get there, especially if they make the game more exciting, right? Like how are you reaching out to these people that may not necessarily know about soccer? And when we talk about the Indy 11 and how well it was attended when I was there, I'm not even sure that everybody was necessarily a soccer fan. They may have gotten free tickets. Maybe one of their friends knew about it. It was something to do. And now it's it's fairly profitable because it's something that you can go out, have a good time at, And I think that that's one of the things that is really interesting about soccer. And one of the reasons why it's growing is because it is a really good spectator sport to actually attend, right? You know, every sport has its own different things, right? Football games, you have those diehard fans. Um, Basketball games, it's super fast. You have these big explosive plays. Hockey is kind of like people running over people, knocking them around. Like, it's really really interesting, but – as far as soccer, right, what, what is it that draws crowds there, right? It definitely has the thing, uh, definitely has the in-person attendance uh, that is necessarily necessary for a team to, to be profitable. But when you're talking about the whole league, I think that that next expansion part and what you see a lot of people thinking about is how are we going to uh, expand this to the, the television audience as well. And I think that once Major League Soccer can do that and have a um, – a presence throughout the, the entire U.S., like football or basketball or baseball or soccer does, then that's when you're really going to start to see that boom. Um, so I think that that's one thing that I'm definitely looking out for uh, in the future as well. Yeah. So, John, what network would you find MLS games on? So they're, they're split between uh, ESPN and Fox uh, in terms of their TV deal right now. ESPN's got the majority of them. Fox grabs a, a few headliner games. Uh, and then in local markets, you've got uh, local channels. So I live in New York. We've got uh, Yes Network, the, the Yankees Network, uh, who covers our, our local matches. But ESPN has actually developed a, a pretty great package, um, both on their, their normal networks and then their ESPN Plus platform. Um, and I know I watch the majority of my games on ESPN Plus, uh, so I can catch 
out of market games that are going on uh, basically anywhere. It's not a, exactly an NFL league pass, but it's something just short of that. So uh, you you got a good uh, package to, to actually get out there and watch uh, a lot of matches from all around if you're interested in doing that. I think one of the things that Major League Soccer needs to, to get over as a hurdle, even for their diehard fans, is getting fans to watch uh, matches that aren't their teams. I, I watch every single New York City uh, match. I watch key matches in the, the league between really good teams, but I, I don't necessarily have a, a big reason to watch a, a Houston Dynamo versus Real Salt Lake match. Uh, it's not, I don't care about these cities. I don't care about these teams. They don't have the big stars uh, that, that are on those teams. And that's one thing that uh, you get with certain sports uh, and, and you don't get with others. Um, and, and every sport sort of goes through trends with that. I know I think baseball is the one who's really been, you can tell on the, the decline is, I mean, baseball fans watch the playoffs and then they watch their team. You know, you're not watching a bunch of random NL games on a, a, a random Tuesday night to, to just be like, oh, I'm catching someone because my team's not on. Um, Major League Soccer definitely has, has got to struggle with that. And I know even the diehard fans in Major League Soccer, I, I know from sitting with my season ticket holder supporters, guys who go to every single game, know very few players from the other teams. They're, they're not studying up on the, the key players. It doesn't have that. Do you think that that could change, or what do you think it would take for the casual fan to start looking into uh, these different types of sports or these different types of teams, right? Um, for example, I'm a coach fan for football, but at the same time, I've liked different teams throughout my uh, throughout my years. I used to like the Chargers a lot when they had like LT, which also kind of sucked because for some reason, no matter how good the Colts were, the Chargers always like used to like be a pest for us, whether it was in the playoffs or the regular season. It seemed like they had our car more often than not. You could have a bye the first round and they would just come out and, and dominate us. Um, but I think for me, one of the things that drew me towards some of these other teams was those individual players, right? Like when you have these dynamic players that just shine, right? Uh, you're like, oh, well, I'm following this player. And then once you start following the player, maybe you start following the team as well. At least that's what happened to me in some of those situations. But with respect to uh, the MLS, what do you think it would take for fans uh, just in general to start following other teams as well as as their their teams that are that are local. I, I think MLS has got a much easier road to do this, uh, but it's going to cost a lot of money to, to get there. It's going to take investment to action. Um, I, I think to to really get that traction, at least in my experience with sports, it's been that you have some outside reason to really study and know the sport. I know the NFL. My appreciation for my team and how much I watch my team's uh, games with intent has actually waned over the years, but I know so many more players from so many other teams go play fantasy football. And I want to beat both of you guys in fantasy football, so I'm studying up on on players from teams that I wouldn't normally care about. But uh, I, I had the same thing when I, I was watching college basketball. And in college uh, especially, I was looking at teams that were in our conference and then even teams that were on a, a larger scale, because I had a reason to know those players, either because they were people that my university was recruiting, and I, I know them from when they were thinking about coming to, to my university, or we were going to maybe see them in the tournament, or I knew they would go pro. So I wanted to know who these players were so, so I could know back when, and I, I wanted to know about what Darren Williams is doing so we could see what we would do against him in the championship. I knew whether he was that good, and I wanted to know, I wanted to have an opinion on whether he would do well in the pros. Soccer has actually got a great outside system, and it's called FIFA. I mean, I know so many players from European leagues that even ones that I don't actively watch, right? Because I play FIFA, I know the players in FIFA. Uh, I, I've got friends who play FIFA, and no, they don't even watch soccer at all, but they know all these players in, in Europe. We'll, we'll hop on and play a match against each other, and they're just out there mispronouncing every person's name because they, they're just reading them off the, the screen. It's the only place I've ever seen it, right? 
Uh, I'll watch Premier League games that aren't my team because I know those players. It's built in because I've, I've really studied the match in this. If if MLS can get the quality of player to start showing up for for really usable players on FIFA, essentially, they're going to get so much more traction. I think that that's a huge tipping point that they could reach. Um, but to get there, they really need to invest in, in better players. Uh, one of the disadvantages that it has is that it's a global sport. Uh, NBA has a global audience, but it's not a global sport. They're not competing against uh, other leagues. Um, NFL is getting more global traction, but they don't have to compete against other American football uh, uh, around the globe. MLS has got to compete. MLS has got to get eyeballs. Uh, Americans can choose to tune into the Premier League or League of MACs, or they can do MLS. And sure, they could do all three, but you only got so much time to, to watch sports. So if you can get players who are world-class players and really teams that are built up of world-class players, not just one or two per, per team that are your shining stars, but if you can get world-class players to make world-class teams, I think they can reach a tipping point where they can get traction, even if it's just through FIFA awareness. But they got to reach some sort of level where they get that, that tune in. I think they've got an advantage that they can really invest in it, but the owners are really going to have to pony up to, to get to that. Yeah. John, I think you have a point, and I think what really can happen in order to really increase, you know, the awareness and how much people follow the sport is just to advertise more, is to have more people on TV. I mean, growing up in the 90s, Sports Center commercials had all the people that, that you loved to see, and they were doing goofy stuff, and it made them human, gave them personalities. And I think if we started seeing MLS players just being pushed more in the media – being shown as, you know, hey, this guy's an MLS player. He's a really good soccer player. And he, honestly, they don't need to be good players. I know that it matters to have high quality, but the best of what you have is still good enough. And if the media says that this is the guy we should we should really like and invest in, then I think that that will help a lot in terms of the league's profile and getting more people to watch, want to watch those certain players. And you pick a player from each team – and you, you hype them up because there always has to be the best player on a team, no matter if he's good or not. And I think that will help a lot just to increase the media profile. I think they missed out on a huge opportunity with the 2018 World Cup because I think everyone was so primed to do exactly what you're talking about there, where they, they had the spots lined out. They were ready to feature all these players that, that weren't really on a world-class scale yet. And they, then they proved that they weren't on a world class cap by not qualifying right at the, the last <laughs> moment. So I think they missed out on a huge opportunity. I, speaking for myself, I know basically all the women on the, the women's national team right now, I mean, they're, they're world champions. Um, the men's national team, I know a lot of players in the pool, but they don't even really have a solid team right now. They don't have one set of guys that are really locked in. And the, the players who are locked in are all, all players who play in Europe, especially like the, the Bundesliga in Germany. So they they don't have the, the traction, uh, especially the MLS players don't have the traction in the team. The team doesn't have the traction on a, a world scale to, to be showing up. And missing that opportunity in 2018 was just absolute. Yeah, I thought that that was uh, something that could hurt because – when you're talking about the two different teams, the national teams with respect to the women's team and the men's team, there's probably more people in the U.S. that know athletes from the women's national team because they're dominant. They have a bunch of interesting characters, right? And they have a bunch of endorsements. You don't only see them when there's the World Cup. You also see them in advertisements. You see them um, making like political stands or on TV shows with interviews. So the repetition of your visualizing these players is a lot more frequent than it is for, for the men, right? Yeah. I mean, Megan Rapino is far and away the most dynamic soccer player that we have in the U.S. right now. It's not close. Yeah. And she's earned that spot. She is a, a, a multi-time world champion. Uh, she's proven it on the field. She's proven it off the field. She's, I mean, she stood up to the, the president of the – the quote unquote free world at this point. So, I mean, she she is the most dynamic character we have in the sport in the U.S. right now. Power to her. But the men, if they want to get on her level, they need to stop. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one thing that I thought about, especially when you're talking about expansion and how can you increase the audience 
uh, a lot of times when we see college athletes or uh, I think all related more to college because the NBA is a little bit more developed. Players stay in the league a lot, a lot longer. But as far as college, one of the ways that you start seeing people may just be because of, like, you, like Jeremy was talking about, the television exposure. And I think that maybe they could try to, like, partner with, like, restaurants and bars and stuff like that to actually show, um, like, every one of their games, right? So that it's always on the TV. So people will start to see it. And I think for me, I used to not get soccer at all. I just, like, they are just running up, running up and down the field, didn't seem organized. I couldn't figure out what was going on. And the first time that I really understood soccer was when I was in undergrad doing research in a lab. I think it might have been like the World Cup, uh, the FIFA World Cup. And then uh, a lot of my lab mates were from all over the world. So they just went and watched the games. And initially, I'm just like looking and not understanding. But then I started to get the idea of getting positioning, right? Like setting guys up. And you can start to see those things. And I think once you can start to see that, then you can start to realize how dynamic some players are, right? If you can see LeBron James go up and make a dunk, it's easy to tell that he is a dominant player, right? But if you just turn on a soccer match and you just look, there's so many different positions. And if you don't understand what those positions are supposed to be doing, how can you really understand how good those players are or how, um, how dynamic what they're doing is, you know? And I think that that's one of the things that I would try to focus on as well with highlighting some of those players and making sure that people understand uh, like how good this is. But I think that comes from exposure. So Basketball is the perfect parallel too, because, you know, being that it, it basically came from soccer, it's the perfect idea to, you know, to visualize the game. If you like basketball, I think it's a lot easier to get into soccer to understand how it works, how the passing works, how, like you said, the positioning and where you're putting the players and everything. I think that's perfect. And that's, if you like basketball, yeah, it's, it's easy to get into soccer because you'll be able to understand it a lot more, I think. With any sport, you got to study the game to really get the, the dynamics of it. I mean, football's got to be some of the most complex to, to really get a, a grip on when you think about, even once you understand how the plays work uh, and different nuances of that, then counteracting those plays and, and what, what types of defenses, uh, that's half the game right there. I mean, uh, I still struggle with seeing where what safeties are doing and how they're actually lining up in different plays and, and trying to, to counteract that. So there's all sorts of nuance to, to different sports. But you start at the, the key point of excitement and work your way backwards. And I think oh, soccer catches a lot of flack for not having a lot of goals, whereas you got the NBA, they're scoring every other time down. They, they've got emphatic dunks. I mean, you get three-pointers. You start from that point of excitement and then you just latch on to the, the rest of the sport. What I'll say is one of my favorite sports experiences that I've, I've had is the World Cup um, and in 2014, being in New York for the, the World Cup, being able to walk down the streets of Manhattan. I, uh, there was a U.S. game uh, that I was at work and I was trying to get out of work by the time the, the match started. And I went to, to pop out of work and I, I made it out and I think the third minute of the, the match. And as I was walking out of the door to try to get to the nearest bar, uh, the U.S. scored a goal. Clint Dempsey scored early in the, the match. And it was the only time walking down the streets of Manhattan, you could actually hear the whole city cheering. <laughs> there was cheering out of cars. There was cheering out of every single bar because everyone had it on. And everyone was rooting for the, the same team. And you can have those magical moments uh, in soccer. And it's one of the, the only sports where everyone can really get behind a, a moment like that, where you can get that type of unification. But the supporters and the fandom in, in soccer is so different than you get from other sports that, I mean, there is a, a huge moment of excitement that if you're, if you're attached enough to that, you can figure out the way. Yeah, I remember the same thing, being in bars and noticing everyone just, just going crazy like the whole bar just like lit just energy and that was really exciting to see you know what I mean uh and just one other point that you made previously that I thought was actually very interesting is that you're talking about there's not as much scoring frequency in soccer as there is for um like football or basketball right and that's 
that's one of the things that like I guess baseball kind of deals with hockey kind of deals with also uh, I think hockey gets away with it because they have it's a very fast paced game right and there's a lot of like things that are happening even when goals aren't being scored that you can see because everything's in that visual and then baseball it's like all right you get your hot dog you chill but it's not it's not like a exciting type thing uh and then when you're comparing it to football and basketball right those games also have increased the scoring by a huge amount over the years right and some of that came because of rule changes whether it was uh, making it so that quarterbacks if they get touched on the pinky uh, it's a personal foul, right? They wanted to have, like, big, uh, bigger plays, right? Wide receivers, they can't be touched after five yards, right? Basketball, it's kind of like they call more fouls. Like, they sped up the game. They pushed back the three-point line, opened it up. Do you feel that there's something that they could do with soccer to increase the scoring frequency? And if they did, would that be an issue for diehard fans of soccer already? Or would that have a bigger impact on bringing new fans to the game as well? Well, one, I think I disagree with the premise that the, the scoring is what makes it exciting. We're, we're not all fans of arena football. Uh, we, we, like, we like regular American football, but arena football is too much. It becomes too hokey yeah. at a certain point. Right? So it's not all about the, the scoring. And the tension is a big portion of it. Can you create the drama? Can you create the suspense? And can you do that without having a lot of school nerd? Because I, I honestly just don't think it's in soccer. It's not like the NFL where you can just wholesale um, make big rule changes and, and change the whole sport or year over year. Um, you can't do in basketball and just move the – the three-point line, add a three-point line uh, at one point. Yeah, so make, this is make something we need. A lot shorter, make the go a lot yeah. wider or something. Yeah. You've got soccer everywhere, right? And you don't want to make it just a sport that's just about, like, how we do it in America. You want to be part of that global game. You want to associate yourself with a, a global fandom on there because you want to be able to, to be fully integrated and transferable between different nations. And so – the, the rules are the rules you, you, you're going to have to play within them. It's just how can you create a better product within those rules? And uh, the game has evolved. And in Europe, you'll see different leagues that have uh, evolved over time. Italian soccer used to be extremely defensive. It was what they were known for is just defend, defend, defend. If, you can, if you're on the road and you can get a 0-0 match, great. That, that's basically a win for you. And over time, they've, they've been forced to change different styles of passing, different counterattacking. Um, there's been all different strategies that have actually allowed people to work within the rules uh, to, to make the game more exciting uh, and even increase the, the goal count. Uh, but you, you have to do it through high-quality coaching and high-quality players. And MLS can absolutely do it, but they're going to have to. Yeah, I would like to see... I'd like to see what happens if you got rid of offsides, though. If all of those goals that were, like, barely, you know, called back because of offsides, I mean, that would definitely change things. And then it would leave a lot of people not feeling, you know, disappointed. Because, John, you mentioned the tension leading up to the score. I feel like there's a metaphor there. But the fact is, like, once you don't score after you've built up that tension, there's mm -hmm. also, a, you know, an appropriate comparison there, too. So yeah. I think at some point, you know, how interesting would it be if you got rid of some of those kind of tiny little rules that prevented the scoring? And how would they that change the game? Offsides? I think offside, offsides are completely... I mean, yeah, was, Jeremy, you know me, yeah. and I'm a master of loopholes. I mean, I love <laughs> right. a loophole unlike anybody right. else. Uh, so I will exploit a loophole until uh, we it, it becomes not fun anymore. Uh, my... Just as a, a quick aside, my parents had this card game. Have you guys ever heard of Liverpool card game? Uh, I have not. never. It's like a it's a rummy based card game. You got to make sets and books and whatever. My parents had to change the rules of those games they had been playing for decades because I found a loophole in the the game to basically discard all of my cards and get a zero every time, uh, <laughs> so I could not play the game. I mean, you don't want to create a loophole that you can actually exploit to the extent that it actually ruins the, the game. I think 
that's that's what getting rid of something as fundamental as offsides would do. Um, I mean, there would be players down there cherry picking, just waiting. You could set up whole offenses that are about booting the ball down. And now you got sort of spread out defenders who have to guard them, so they have to hang back, and it, it could totally interrupt the flow. But I think you're talking about a whole different. I think I have a similar take uh, as you do, John. I don't think that I don't think that you need to change the game, right? As far as like more scoring and one of the things that we saw with MLS in the past is that initially they did try to make it more of an Americanized game right and they realized that they were losing some people to that because it didn't feel like soccer you know what I mean and I feel that we know soccer can work because we see it internationally it's huge pretty much everywhere right and it's like if you, you already have a product that's really good now you just have to figure out how to market it towards a different type of audience, right? And I feel like that's the biggest thing is that how is the MLS going to market it? And I think that one thing to keep in mind is that this league is still very new in the sense of how long it's been around compared to a lot of these other leagues. So there is going to be some type of stagnation with the, the aspect of how quickly it's going to grow compared to where other sports are right now. But I do feel that the majority of people that are involved in MLS see its expansion. And that's why there's so many new investors in MLS because they know that it's going to grow. It's, it's not about, is it going to get there? It's more about when and what steps are going to be taken to get it to that, to that level. So I, I agree with you on that, John, like don't change around the game too much, like keep it how it is and then just figure out a way to make it more marketable make it more exciting to the, to the masses that, don't necessarily know about it and um, also enhance the experience for the fans that you already have as well. It's kind of crazy high ceiling uh, as a sport, right? Even if Americans aren't tuning in, if they can be uh, the best league in the world or even one of the best leagues in the world, there's enough of a global audience that you don't even need Americans. There, there are a lot of people in Spain who are watching Spanish soccer, but it pales in comparison to the amount of people who watch Spanish soccer around the globe and tuning in to see Barcelona play Real Madrid. That, that has so much more a global audience than it does a domestic audience. I think the focus on just making the quality of the, the game better, uh, that's got to be the, the focus. I think right now, I mean, there have been American leagues in the past that have folded, and they've been worried about folding it and trying to protect their investment. And at a certain point, they really have to push all the chips in and really go for it. Um, do you want to be a league that just exists or do you want to be a league that is globally competitive? And right now they've, they've been making the choice to be a league that exists and they know the route to get to a globally competitive league. They just have to draw a couple more zeros on the, the end of the, the team's bank accounts when they go to actually go buy players. You know, um, I think we've been kind of skirting around this topic a little bit in that how did the league grow from its first year in 1996 in popularity and in, in its um, actual acceptance. So what do you think, John, was kind of what were the factors in helping the league grow from what it is or what it was then to what it is now? So I know we've been kind of mentioning it, growth, 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 but we haven't really gotten like into that. I, th I think that's a great question. Uh, to some extent, I think it was a bit inevitable. I think it was the, the sport itself has gained popularity in the U.S. And even in the absence of a major league soccer, I think uh, the sport itself has gained popularity. There are way more people who watch the Premier League and the U.S. now than I watched the Premier League uh, back in the mid-90s, which was almost none. So now you can walk around the, the streets and see people wearing Liverpool jerseys and Manchester United jerseys. And you have people who ascribe to be Arsenal fans. I didn't grow, in, I didn't grow up with any Arsenal fans. I didn't know any Arsenal fans. Now I know plenty of Arsenal fans, or at least people who claim to be Arsenal fans, right? I mean, that it went from being niche to, to starting to become popular just as a, a sport. So people were going to be looking for a domestic outlet anyways. They, they're right in the back of that. I think every World Cup cycle has given it a great boost. Every single time there's a World Cup, having the, the World Cup in the U.S., in the 90s is what actually created this sport um, because the FIFA, when they awarded the U.S. the World Cup, said that the U.S. needed to have a domestic league to be able to have this. And some of those nascent stars in the World Cup who actually showed out 
when they're there, the, the guys who actually put up a, a fight against a Colombian team that they were supposed to get absolutely wrecked by, now you have a star like Alexi Lalas, who becomes not a household name, but at least a name in the sport to American fans and they can glom onto. So every single cycle has seen something like that. And the, the U.S. has had heroics as uh, most of the World Cups, whether that's in Korea, almost beat Germany to make it to the semifinals. you got Tim Howard's performance against Belgium, where he sets the World Cup record for, for most saves. you got Landon Donovan's goal to, to send us through out of the, the group stage in South Africa. I mean, we've been pretty lucky to have some really high drama uh, teams in the, the World Cups, and that's been a huge boost. And then another reason why 2018 really hurt us. Um, and then you have the, the growth of the new market. I'm a fairly new market fan. New York, quote unquote, had a team, even though it was in New Jersey. Um, but I became a fan of MLS because they made a team in my backyard. And I could get on from, from day one and I could go to all the matches and be there for it. That's why I'm part of it. I have friends in Orlando who have done the same thing. When Orlando got uh, Orlando City Soccer Club, uh, they became big fans. They became some. I have friends who have season tickets in Atlanta who never would have uh, jumped off. Being able to actually expand its new markets has created more fandom. And at a certain point, you create a momentum that actually keeps pushing you forward at a faster and faster pace. It's just uh, where are you going to get to with the amount of investment we have now? And that's something that the, the league has to choose for itself. Yeah, I, I think uh, one thing to add on to that that I thought was interesting when you're talking about the growth in fans. Some of my like cousins and friends, when they were young and they played soccer, right? They didn't necessarily have these big name athletes or these or the the MLS to like really be diehard fans of. And whenever I saw somebody with a jersey on, right, it's like. FC Barcelona or something. It's more about the international teams. And one thing that I think can be very valuable to MLS is uh, youth soccer, right? And how they approach youth soccer, how they um, partner with youth soccer, and um, how they start to build that camaraderie, I guess, in a sense, between like the younger group um, and, and MLS, right? Because if you can get these uh, youth to interact with these MLS players, maybe they'll start wearing their jerseys around all the time, right? It'll, you're switching out the, the league that they like more, right? Or the league that they are more likely to watch because they have an association with these players. And in the future, if they have this association, well, then they're going to start being bigger fans of the MLS when they get into their 20s and 30s. And that's just going to expand the league in addition to the people that are already coming because of they're either local fans or they play soccer all their life. And now they want to expose their kids to it or whatever. So I think that developing a relationship with youth soccer is going to be really important for the exponential growth of MS MLS. And I'm not sure exactly what they're doing right now with that, but I think that's, that's definitely something that could be interesting to look into. I think there's a, a very quiet groundswell of exactly what you're talking about. Um, and Major League Soccer, all of the teams right now have their own academies. And those academies, while they have uh, youth players who come in and play just for those academies, they're also affiliated with a lot of youth teams in their areas. Uh, they're doing that because they want to draw from a certain player pool to actually build up players. So they've got advantageous rules to actually grow players through their academy. Um, do, do either of y'all know who Gio Reyna is? I don't. <laughs> no. Gio Reyna is going to be the next big American soccer star. Oh, the, the dirty secret is he's already the next big American soccer star. He might be the best player uh, that has an American passport right now. And if not, he's getting pretty close. He's, he's making a big catch on Christian Pulisic, who's had a, a lead for a while. Gio Reyna is 17 years old. He's playing for Borussia Dortmund in Germany. Uh, so... Borussia Dortmund's in second place in the, the Bundesliga. They're, they are um, just behind Bayern Munich. He is playing in Champions League games. He's, he is facing up, uh, literally going on the field with Neymar to, to go head-to-head -head with them at, at 17. And he, he came up through 
New York City FC's academy. Now, his dad, Claudio Reyna, was president of New York City FC. He's got the pedigree behind him. And Claudio Reyna played for the, the U.S. national team at World Cups. So he, he had the, the training both through New York City FC and the exposure that he got to all those star players and being able to work with that, that club from the time he was very young uh, until now. But he goes over to Europe and he's immediately popped into, but not just like he's on the roster there. He's playing in every game at Borussia Dortmund since the, the restart. So like Luka Doncic, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But from, from New York, right? Yeah. That's, that's, how they, that's how they're thinking of him over in Germany. Mm. You know, he's, the, he's the transplant coming in from the, the country that's not actually supposed to be that good at the sport. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I, was, I was really impressed when I saw that MLS had youth academies because I know that's a big part of European soccer is they get to the kids early and they give them financial incentives to stay there, right? They know that they can go through that academy, they can become pros early, and they can make that money. So I think that that's good because I think part of our system in America is how we value amateurism so much that we actually, I think, take away from the quality. The people that could be good enough to go directly to the professional levels, we're holding them back. And I think that kind of changes their, their development because developing in college versus developing in the pros, two totally different things. So I think it's really cool that they have those academies. But what I want to ask about those academies and, and that system, when you have a guy like Reyna, you said, he's playing in, in Europe. That's where the money is, right? The money in, in the MLS doesn't quite compare. So how do you get a, a homegrown player who's good enough to play in Europe to stay here and actually help build the league? That's a great question. I mean, one way to do it is have a league that's really good enough to be one of the top leagues in the world. Uh, so you, you have those players. I think you're starting to see players making that as a more serious choice. I think there was a certain time where players didn't think about Europe as an option. They just went to – their. I mean, Major League Soccer for a long time has drawn a lot of their talent just off the colleges. Now the college draft to Major League Soccer means very little. I mean, you get a couple players that, that'll come out of college each year that uh, will really be an asset to a Major League Soccer team. You get maybe half a round at, at best in a, in a draft. And then the rest is, is really players who are not even going to be rotation. By the time you are 22, you need to be starring for a team. You need to be making money already. I mean, you should, if you're wanting to get good training, you need to be at a pro team, not being an amateur in college, whether that's in Europe or in the, the U.S. There, there was a big coup with Jordan Morris in, in Seattle. Uh, he's a, a star on the U.S. national team and had a chance to go play in the, the Bundesliga. He, he had this offer to go over, not to uh, an absolutely great uh, German team, but a, a very solid German team, and he decided to to stay home. It was the club of his youth. Um, he cared about the, the club overall. He already had fans that were behind him, and he wanted to be close to home as well. He, he wanted to be in his home country, and it's something that you see a lot even in Europe, where they have these big teams that are, I mean, hugely, hugely popular and get anywhere in the world you still see a, a majority of the league is made up of domestic players. A majority of the Spanish league is Spanish players. A majority of the English league is English players. A majority of the Italian league is Italian players. And you have players who really want to be at home for the teams that they grew up rooting for, the teams that they wore the jersey of, the teams that they were rooting for. And part of that's going to be building up that history and that, that connection with those players. But – if we really want to be able to, to get the very best players in the world to, to stay here, I think we have to get it. It's worth staying for. I do think also, though, it was kind of a cool um, time period, and they still do this, where you had that washed-up kind of European player, like when Beckham came over, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right now, Zlatan, it says, is one of the highest paid, if he's still playing. This is from 2018. Well, yeah, Zlatan back to... to Italy for this season, but he... Okay, so where, when he was, when I, I'm seeing this, like, data from 2018, where he was one of the highest paid players, uh, Schweinsteiger, like, a lot of guys yeah. that 
probably Wayne Rooney somehow was still playing. I thought he had been retired. We're on the tail end of that that trend right now, but yeah. it, it's been a huge trend, especially for the last, I'd say, five years is when it became crazy popular. You get, I mean, and Beckham uh, probably was the thing that kept the MLS going for a little bit, right? Yeah, I mean, he was the the one player that really everyone who watched Sports Center knew. Whether it was because he had his name on a movie, or you actually knew him from playing in Europe, and so he he was the household name uh, that made MLS relevant for a certain subset of fans, and they definitely benefited from his likeness. And I mean, whether it's David Villa or Frank Lampard and Pirlo in New York. Schweinsteiger was was big for Chicago. Uh, L.A. has had a rotation of guys. Kaká came through Orlando. I mean, they, they've tried to do this in different uh, places. And I think the only massive one that you have right now is uh, in L.A., I think you've got – with Giovanni Dos Santos coming in, uh, he, he was a guy that uh, was – sort of not necessarily on the, the upswing of his career. And he, he's now gone, but they've replaced him uh, with Chicharito. Uh, Chicharito coming in. Chicharito is a player who really is, I think, by, by all means, washed up uh, from Europe. And <laughs> he even there, – there was, there was some video that, that leaked out on social media of him talking about going to, to L.A. to sort of uh, take it easy. Uh, I forget the exact wording, but he was definitely implying that he's basically retiring uh, to, to L.A. So you got Chicharito. He's been the best player in the, the Mexican national team for a long time, and that's been a huge draw, especially for the L.A. teams. that They've had a lot of really great Mexican nationals uh, out there. But uh, hopefully for, for me, I, I would like to see MLS making their own stars at this point. I think you've got a lot of cool – exciting names that are, are building up. I don't think you you necessarily have to get the, the the washed up guys from Europe, but I mean, I'm a New York City fan and that's basically how we built uh, our franchise. So I, I can't complain too much. Going along that same concept, but a little bit different, uh, differently, uh, different type of topic. So when you're talking about these big names that people recognize and how those help draw fans to either the teams or even knowing that they have a soccer team, right? Uh, how do you think the influence of adding people that are already athletes as owners um, from other leagues is going to gonna go for the MLS with respect to popularity or growth in general? Well, has it worked so far? Do you know all the celebrity owners and especially athlete owners uh, MLS? I'm, I'm guessing you're asking because there's some big news that just came out this week with a, a brand new athlete owner who's made a big investment. Yeah, I, I feel like I don't necessarily have that sense because there is no soccer team, uh, MLS soccer team that's in San Diego, but a lot of those athletes that are getting this ownership in these leagues – are typically in the same city as the team that they're an ownership and uh, an owner, yeah. right? So, with James Harden, right, with uh, Houston, right, it has there been a presence? Has the fan base increased since he's became an owner? I'm not necessarily sure, but it was an interesting concept that I thought, well, well, what what happens with this? Right? Is it just an investment in the sense of they're just an investor, or is it an, an investment in the sense of hey, we know this person is a visual um, representation of sports within this city, and hopefully they can help or their ownership can help out with bringing fans to to our our team and our league as well. I'm, I'm interested to see with, especially Kevin Durant, uh, making a, a big investment in the, the Philadelphia Union. Uh, the Union are definitely not one of MLS's more popular teams. Yeah. Uh, so I'm interested to see how much he really goes to, to try to boost that up. I, for one, haven't seen a big impact of James Harden um, on uh, the, the team in, in Houston. I haven't seen Russell Wilson and Sierra really being that visible in Seattle. I mean, Seattle had its own soccer culture uh, well before them, uh, and they hopped on. I mean, they're, they're in a teams company. I think Drew Carey is still a part owner of Seattle too. Uh, for me, the most 
like out there celebrity owner that I've seen doing the most and actually lending himself and his personality to the, the team to boost them up is Will Ferrell. <laughs> they, they had, and for LAFC, they, they've been around for just a couple of years now, but um, Will Ferrell got in on the LAFC uh, <sighs> team from really early on in the, the ownership group, just from the, the very beginning, basically. And he's out there on so many LFC, LAFC promos, and he's up, he's very visible at all the, the matches. Um, and I mean, he's got a, a personality where he can just make short, goofy videos to, to prop anything up. I mean, yeah, he, he did he that was, video uh, for, he doing that. yeah, he did that video with the Seahawks, right? Where, where yeah, he joined he one of their, for their USC. practices. Oh yeah. He did it. He did it with USC as well. Right. I, I was he's thinking like of the USC. one where he, he joined the, the training camp video for the Seahawks. He, he was acting like he was the the new player on the the team who who's hopping in and just telling how he's going to contribute. I mean, he's just that guy, right? So it'll be interesting to see if KD. I mean, he's savvy. He he's focused on his investments in the past. I heard him propping up a lot of his other investments. So it'd be interesting to see uh, if how much he wants to contribute of his time, of his personality to, to this, especially while he's still ball. My take on it is that these are sound financial investments for the players because there's so much commitment to growing the league and the returns are probably going to be really good. From what I understand of the ownership structure, it seems like the league is in a good position to, to profit because there is the, the centralized ownership of the entire league which is, I've never heard of this type of a thing before, but it helps me understand how the league could succeed, kind of pooling their resources in a sense. But John, do you have any any idea how that works in terms of like Kevin Durant buys into the Philadelphia Union? And from what I understand, everyone who owns a team or a part of a team owns a part of the league as well. So do you know like his 5% or whatever, what is that in terms of owning MLS? It's really more of a franchise structure and more of a authentically a franchise structure than most of the other. MLS, unlike other leagues in the, the U.S., is technically a single entity league. The paychecks from the players come from MLS. The decisions for how much to pay them come from the teams, uh, and then they spend up into their cap, and then they can actually spend over their cap in these certain exceptional scenarios. Uh, so from a visual standpoint, it looks like they're, they're paid out by the teams like you would see in any other major sport, but it's actually a single entity league. Uh, so the league has more control over the franchise. And so when he buys in, he's buying into more of a franchise, uh, than just buying a, a team. I mean, in theory, Jerry Jones could say, I'm packing up the, the Cowboys and I'm going off to my own league and doing my own thing. And he'd have to break out of some contracts, but he's got his team. You can't do that with the, the MLS. You just own really one twenty-sixth of the, the league uh, as you go and do that. It's all part of the same uh, piece. Initially, there was not there. There were teams that were managed by the same owners, right? Uh, and eventually, it seems like that hasn't happened as much. But one of the things that I saw was that these owners were so focused on making this league exist and grow that they invested a lot of money already to get it to the place that it, that it is. Uh, and I think that that's an interesting uh, thought and concept because when comparing that to other leagues that may have failed, right, maybe that was part of the reason why, right? You need to have that financial thing. And I think that that's one of the, the points that you were talking about, right? those finances, right? This is an investment, right? This is a business just like any other business. And you have to invest in uh, prospects, right? You have to invest in current people. You have to invest in media. You have to invest in uh, stadiums, right? That was a huge thing for uh, MLS, like building their own stadiums and how that changed around their game. Not necessarily just from like renting a uh, facility, but making it more of a of an environment for, for those games. I, I went to... I think it was Dallas or – oh, Dallas. It was Dallas when they built, like, that new uh, stadium for the Cowboys. It was huge, right? And they had the NBA All-Star game there. But everyone that went just was like, 
it didn't feel right. It didn't feel like a basketball game because the stadium was way too big. The sound wasn't there, the environment, the intensity. And I feel like MLS understood that. And they're like, you know what? We have to make our own stadium. Because if we're not, if we don't, we're going to lose our fans that we already have. So I think that they have a really good system with respect to the ownership and leaders, right? Is it Dan Garber? Dan Gerber? Garber? Don Gerber, yeah. Don Gerber. He has a vision uh, of where he wants to take the league. And I think that that's, that's really good, right? If you think about like some of these leagues that have really been strong, a lot of them have really good ownership that not only um, does well, but the players respect and the players kind of like uh, support and surround around them, I guess, as well. So, yeah. I mean, I think they've done well to, to get to there. I, I do want to talk about them coming back and the way that the owners have come together with the players to actually come back. So they're going to be, I think, really the first major American league, the, the biggest one yet, that will come back from the – the COVID uh, pandemic and actually starting matches up again. They're, they're due to start July 8th with a, a whole tournament to actually get back into the, the matches. So I think that's another opportunity to get eyeballs on the league, to, to be out there before anyone else, to, to be the sports that's on TV and they can take over from cornhole, I guess, uh, as the, the next uh, most popular sport that's actually uh, out there for viewership right so yeah, I told you, I knew that cornhole, man. I knew it was going to be big. <laughs> I knew it. But uh, could you explain the tournament that they're having? Yeah, so uh, I think they're doing it in a really smart way. Um, they're, they're coming back with a tournament. It's a tournament that didn't exist before. It's a special one-time only tournament. They call it the MLS's Back Tournament. Starts in July 8th, and they're getting all 26 teams that come down to Orlando, sort of be in a bubble where they can control things. They can do a lot of testing. They can make sure that uh, players are doing proper social distancing. They're doing all of the, the stuff that you're already seeing from European leagues that have started back up uh, to make sure that uh, they're, they're not getting uh, players infected and then spreading it amongst the league. Uh, I think they're still having some risk and they're aware of that, uh, but they're going to go ahead and quarantine players as best they can, have uh, matches going on, uh, starting, they're going to do morning matches, they're going to do evening matches, they're going to do late night matches, um, and basically they've got all the teams together. They're going to go into a bit of a group stage and then a knockout stage. In the group stage, each team will play three teams in their group, uh, and those games that they're playing are actually going to count to the normal regular season standings, which actually started. Most teams were only two, three games in, when they, they had to pause the, the, the league. Uh, but these group stage matches will count towards the regular season. And then the teams that do the, the best in their groups will qualify and go through and play knockout stage. And they'll, they'll do a little tournament. They, they've got some excitement. They've got uh, all their, their stars out there. They'll, they'll have something to play for. The winner uh, of the team, there's a big monetary incentive for winning the tournament. And then the team that wins also wins a, uh, an entrance into next year's CONCACAF Champions League, which is the Continental Champions League tournament that all the, the best teams from the different leagues in uh, North America play against each other. So there's an incentive for the, the team really to, to win as well. But uh, I think it'll be exciting. I, I know for, for me, I'll be watching a lot more games that I wouldn't normally watch a lot because there's nothing else on, but also because it'll just be fun to see these teams all in a tournament together and really see who's picking up where they left off and who's a bit rusty and, and see what that is. So July 8th is when they'll, they'll start that. August 11th is when they, they'll have the finals of the, of the actual tournament itself. So it gives them a month, action-packed month, tons of games going on every single day. Um, and then after a lar- August 11th, the, the plan is that this will give them the runway to actually come up with the plan for the rest. Do they continue on in Orlando? Do they uh, ship players around the country? Do they only do a few sites? Do they do every uh, team gets home matches but without any fans? Uh, they, they've got a lot of things to decide. I think they're, they're not going to see fans in stadiums this year. You know, um, as a, a season ticket holder, I just got... Uh, a notification from my season ticket rep 
that they're not going to be charging me any more payments for this year. And they're asking me whether I want to refund or to roll over into next year because they're not expecting to have fans and stadiums again this year. But I mean, we'll see how it goes. I think it's smart to go ahead and get started while they, they actually make the final decision on how they do it. Worst comes to worst, we get one cool tournament will actually be something that we can take away this year. And we don't have to risk like, like baseball where there might just be a full on work stoppage and we skip this. Uh, it'll be fun to, to see all these. Uh, yeah, definitely. And I think that one of the things that uh, is interesting with the point that you brought about with the whole conversation and adding it to one of the things that you just uh, discussed is that it seems as major league soccer's biggest source of revenue is having fans in actual seats watching games. So how impactful could that be to the league, right? With respect to, I think, I'm not sure how it is this year. I think I saw an article from like 2000 or about the 2018 season where only 17 uh, of the teams were actually profitable in a sense. Uh, They made a lot of revenue, but as far as like the things they had to spend their money on, uh, only uh, 17 of those teams were were negative, right? Uh, And how is that going to affect it? Or should could that have a a, a huge effect on um, the future, I guess, of the league with respect to the financial part? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes to really any company uh, and how you're about it, any sort of asset and how you're about it. I think sports leagues all around, not just Major League Soccer, but um, the sports leagues this year are going to have to figure out what it's like to actually take a take an L. They, they are a business, and there are a lot of businesses that are struggling. Uh, I think as a percentage of sort of what they're worth, they don't have as, as big a struggle as a lot of your, your local bars and restaurants. So, I mean, there are a lot of companies that are absolutely going to take an L this year, and will they be able to weather that storm? I think we shouldn't feel that bad for the, the owners of, of these teams and the, the franchises themselves. Yes, a lot of the, the teams were already uh, not making profits, but that's only one way of measuring uh, an asset's value. I mean, you have Uber out there that was, was a huge, huge loser when you look at just the, the actual profits, but the value going up year over year. I mean, you see it with all these tech startups is that they are – They've never been profitable. I mean, you look at, at, at Facebook's profits versus how much it's worth for its whole history. You look at, at, at Twitter, you look at Snapchat and, and the valuations you have there. The valuations are all on how much the asset could be one day, right? And Major League Soccer, yeah, they're going to lose a lot of money this year. And the owners are going to have to be able to, to pay to, to not go out of business because of that. Worst comes to worst, they can sell their team for... Uh, a few hundred million dollars, and I think they'll be all right. Um, so they can find a way out of it. But, uh, yeah, you're going to have to pony up because you're holding on to an asset that could be worth uh, major money one day. Or in a lot of the leagues, already is worth potentially billions of dollars. So, yeah, sometimes as a business owner, you got to take a, a loss. Sometimes yeah. you have to, to pony up. I think that's the big picture, right? Because when we're talking about the value, even though they're taking a loss, right, they're, uh, the thing that they're investing is is actually growing, right? Um, they're reinvesting yeah. this money into the team so that they can have a stronger market in the future. And I think that that's something to kind of keep in mind as well with, with a lot of these teams. So I don't know if this is the right number for the salary cap because you talk about reinvesting into the league. Is the salary cap really less than a million dollars? I don't remember what the, the last CBA was. Like, and uh, then how are you supposed to get the best yeah, players? Yeah, it's, a, it's about that level. So uh, Major League Soccer has got a, a soft salary cap with uh, their number that they have. Yes, it's a hard salary cap as, as in you can only spend up to that. It's not like Major League Baseball where you've got true free-for-all. Um, it's not even like the NBA where you've got the soft salary cap where you can go above it and pay the, the luxury tax. You do have a hard cap. But you also have a couple exceptions. And the exceptions in Major League Soccer, the biggest ones are the designated player rules. Um, So for designated players, basically, you can go ahead and pinpoint certain players that you say are, these are my designated players. 
the original rule was created for David Beckham. Basically, you can pay that player unlimited amounts. You can pay him as much as you want, but only a very small amount will actually hit your salary cap. So up and above that, you can do that. And David Beckham was the original one. So then they sort of opened it up to every team. So you can go get a, a designated player of your own, your own star player. They made that two. Then they're up to three. Uh, they're talking about maybe expanding that in the next uh, CBA, but they, they got something uh, signed for now so they can start up again. Um, they've focused in the last couple of negotiations on raising the floor uh, for the salary. I know when I started watching Major League Soccer, showed up to my, my first game and they, they showed all the, the salaries of the, the players if you looked them up online. And we had David Villa and Frank Lampard and Andrea Pirlo, and they were all making about $6 million a year. And then the roster was filled out with players who were making like 40 grand. And uh, it, it's, it's kind of odd to look around and be like, all right, I'm making more money than all these quote unquote stars out there in the field. These guys are riding the bus. These guys are barely getting by um, as, as, as star athletes, whatever. And they really had to do special things to actually get boosted up in the, the salary. There's still a huge disparity between the, the haves and the have-nots. Um, and really, if you want to look at multi-million dollar contracts, you can really only have three per team uh, because of the way the salary cap works. But uh, they're, they're growing it up. And I forget where the minimum salary is, but they've, they've made it into the, the six figures. And so that they have it. There are a couple other exceptions like the homegrown player rule. If you have a homegrown player, their salary doesn't hit your books for a while, so you can keep on some of your star players that you grow yourself. Um, so you can pay them big dollars to, to keep them from going to Europe if, if you want to. But uh, the biggest one is you can buy a few dozen. Again. Every team's got that ability, and all the big market teams have gone out there. Some of the small market teams have just saved money on it. And, not have designated players or only have one, but the big market teams are always out there buying three stars. So what would be, say, NYCFC, what's what's their payroll look like? Then? Right now, uh, they got rid of those sort of aging European stars who could demand that, that salary. But I think they've only got four players who make in over a million dollars right now. So most of their players are in the one to two hundred thousand dollar range uh, i think maxed out is uh the, their top paid player i think only makes three million uh this year i say only three million as though I, that that's unsubstantial for me i mean let's let's go but um i'll take any of these guys salaries at, at this point but uh they, there's still a disparity between the, the haves and have nots where you've only got a few players making uh, over a million, and the rest are sort of one to, to two hundred thousand dollars. Some of the their middlemen maybe making three hundred thousand dollars, but uh, that that's the disparity now. Rather than somebody trotting out there making thirty five grand a year and, and passing in six months, we uh, came up with a term for that. It's called a uh, pippin. When you get pippin, you sign a long contract. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else is just cash in there while you're just like, man. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, just a, a quick question, uh, not anything super big, but just uh, simple pretty much. Are there players that play in MLS that also play overseas as well, or is it typically MLS or national team? Because um, I know that that's one of the things that you see in the – or that you've seen in, like, WNBA. A lot of those players, when they weren't making as much money, would play in multiple types of leagues. Um, in the off season. is that – a is there a situation or a system in place for players in MLS that's similar to that or not really? Not as not the same way that it happens in the, the WNBA, but soccer actually as a global game has a really interesting loan system where players get loaned between. And usually you loan players for a full season or half season. Um, and this happens all over Europe. I mean, the biggest clubs in Europe – have a ton of players out on loan. If you've got a Barcelona, um, if you've got a Manchester United, the, the biggest one I think right now is Chelsea and, and England. They've got something like 50 players who are out on loan. So they've got all these youth players coming up and they loan them out to other teams 
uh, and in other countries or even within the same country uh, where they can actually get more minutes if they go to another team. So they're not quite good enough to be on the, the great team, but they loan them either to, to the same uh, country, maybe down a league, and they play one league down to, to get their minutes in and, and really have some playing time. Um, or they, they loan them out to a different country's league and they, they play over there. And then if they're good enough, they come back or maybe they'll just sell them to that team at the end of their, their contract. In MLS, there's been some loans that have happened. Um, and MLS is actually a bit different because it's, it's one of the only leagues that runs on the timetable that it does. So um, starting up, uh, basically we are – we start the our season towards the tail end of the European season. There's about a month of overlap. So you can actually go and have players who play in MLS and then they, they can play most of the season and then you can ship them over to Europe at the, the end of the season. Uh, or maybe in our off season, you've got another transfer window that opens up. You could transfer out a player to play, uh, say, December or early January through April or May, and then you get them back in the middle of the MLS season, and they've got enough time to, to sort of integrate back in the squad. Uh, there's something that happened with a couple of the key di- guys like Landon Donovan. Landon Donovan was loaned out to, to teams in, in Europe um, while he was uh, playing in MLS. Um, it happened with David Beckham where David Beckham was actually, he, he was playing with the LA Galaxy and they actually loaned him back out uh, to, I believe it was Real Madrid. Uh, so playing huge, huge minutes and in Europe for amazing team and then coming back to the LA Galaxy after that was done. Um, so there have been some things like that, but uh, it, it's, not as, uh, it's not as much where you could just say like the, the whole season happens in the off season like you can uh, with the, the WNBA, and then you've, you've got way less overlap there. So you really can play in Russia, get paid, and then come home and play in the, the WNBA and grow the game. This was a really good uh, conversation. John, you have any questions for us? Any, any advice, any, uh, anything that's on your mind? No, I, I'm happy that y'all are doing this. I, I, I love uh, y'all getting out there. And really making good content for for folks and, and getting your voices out there and and uh, excited to be able to be a contributor to what y'all put together. Definitely, we'll definitely have to have you back on maybe after the tournament uh, during the season just to kind of like see how it is and uh, definitely in the future as well. Thank you for all the input that you gave us. I learned a lot about uh, MLS in a bigger picture, right beyond just the the sport aspect of it. And I think that that's what we're really trying to focus on. So we appreciate your your input and your time as well. Um, and outside of that, like I said, I just want to thank you for for coming and joining us on Beyond Sports with Paul and Jeremy. Um, I'm Paul. Uh, Jeremy's somewhere. I'm here. I'm Jeremy still. <laughs> and uh, remember, remember, uh, follow us on whatever your preferred method of podcast intake is. I mean, we're on Google, we're on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean is our our main host. Just follow us, like us, subscribe, listen, tell your friends. Um, Yeah, thank you guys. And uh, that's it for uh, Beyond Sports with Paul and Jeremy. Until next time. All right, see ya.